I think being mentored is, is, is immensely valuable. Working with somebody who's, um, who's kind of gone through these processes and says, hey, this works, that doesn't work, this sounds really good in a textbook, um, but in reality doesn't work as well. Um, I think that's a fantastic way to go. And then, you know, graduating and moving into something like the Czech Institute or, um, again, it's, to me, it's like getting the foundation of exercise and then how can you get yourself into some kind of internship coaching program? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's the best way to go. Welcome to the Optimum Human Podcast, the show that interviews the world's top experts in fitness, nutrition, mindset, and beyond. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. Uh, bet, 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 bet. Welcome to another episode nice. of the Optimum Human. My name is Brian McKay, and I'm just learning how to use words. <laughs> <laughs> and he's Claude Petrullis, and uh, we are your hosts of the Optimum Human podcast. Uh, today we've got uh, yet another uh, awesome guest. We don't have crappy guests on this show. At least never. I think maybe the hosts, but anyways. No, we're <laughs> great. Come on. This is true. This is true. Um, anyways, so uh, today's guest is Mr. Sam Biznick. Sam, how the hell are you today? Dude, I'm, uh, I'm doing awesome, and I'm glad to be here, man. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to have you on. Now, uh, for our listeners who don't know who you are and what it is that you do, could you give a uh, uh, brief rundown of who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. Uh, well, I, I'd say for about 16 years now, I, I was one of the guys who originally is, you know, um, excited about the corrective exercise kind of movement that started when NASM started, um, you know, partnering with 24 Hour Fitness and so forth. And, um, you know, at that time, I, I met Paul Check, started doing his internship program and um, kind of latched onto that. So my thing has been corrective exercise and uh, I moved into the manual therapy field as I became a massage therapist and neuromuscular therapy. And um, so my, my thing has really been dealing with um, people with pain for the past 16 years, doing hands-on therapy and corrective exercise. So that's, that's where I, the space that I've been operating in. Beautiful. Now, it sounds like you're pretty old school uh, if you've been, been with, uh, following Paul for that long. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I remember when I first started at, at the Institute, and I think I started my first correspondence course with him when I was about 19 or 20, and it was the uh, the original, I think he had um, scientific back training and core. Mm -hmm. And he and still had time, hair. Yeah, exactly. He had hair at the time. <laughs> and, um, and and I remember that uh, going to that old the old Institute that was uh, like in La Jolla, um, and um, at the time, I think there was probably only about 25 or so practitioners. You know, so it was weird. There, there really wasn't that many. I mean, it was probably more than that, but maybe in the like a level three or a level four practitioner, there were very few. Mm -hmm. And now I think there's like 3,000. So it was weird that, you know, over the years, a lot of people actually knew who I was and I had never met the vast majority of practitioners. And I feel kind of like proud to be kind of like in that, in that first bundle of Czech practitioners that are around in the early days, you mm -hmm. know. So, so you're like a Paul Czech hipster doing it before it was cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's pretty fun. <laughs> cool. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, Brian and I, um, we we actually started. Look, we yeah, know we, each we, other. We met at HLC one uh, back in 2013. So, nah. Yeah, and, and we re regret it ever since, right, Brian? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Oh. No, HLC was great. So um, what, what level did you get to, Sam? Uh, well, I went through level three, and, um, you know, I got a, you know, a lot of stories around kind of like my decisions on where I decided to go with my career. Um, back in the day when we did, there, w there was no exercise coach or anything like that. I mean, literally on level one, when it was split into two phases, I mean, you were dropped into spinal rehab, you know, right away. We were doing McKenzie's, how to stabilize disc bulges, like that kind of stuff. Dang. And I remember how crazy that was for a lot of people walking into that class were just trainers. You know, they, they had no idea what they were getting into because it was so technical. And, um, you know, we started doing that work and, and I loved it, you know, because to me it was, um, I had I'd been focusing on people who had orthopedic problems. Now, now, mind you, I was kind of a meathead back then too. I think maybe everybody was. 
because it was, you know, bodybuilding was really what you went to the gym for and what you became a training for, uh, trainer for. There weren't like a lot of sports specific type of training people in the, in the 90s. Um, you know, that was just, that was not a mainstream thing. But um, I had already really loved do, working with people with injuries because I found a niche. I was like, you know, working at a gym, whenever somebody had a knee problem or a back problem, no other trainer wanted to touch them. They were just like, send them to Sam. You know, I don't want to deal with this guy. <laughs> like kryptonite. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, they, they didn't feel comfortable with it. And to me, after reading a couple of books, I had the mentality, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to go read a book on knee problems, a physical therapy book, and, you know, I'm going to be an expert on this. You know, of course, you know, at my age, I, <laughs> I knew everything. But the um, point was is that you just started kind of finding your way around and saying, hey, you know, I just uh, modified exercises and so forth that didn't make people feel worse. And a lot of times they got better. And it was just, it was very simple. It was like, hey, if I just did hamstring curls on this person and made them stronger, uh, all of a sudden they didn't have knee problems anymore and they can squat. You know, there's something to this. And, um, you know, I started going really uh, heavily into the mechanical realm. And at the time, early on in the program also, uh, you know, you didn't talk about nutrition. You didn't talk about lifestyle type stuff really until you got to level four because level four was that stuff. And um, this was long before where that had splintered off and became the holistic, or at the time was nutrition and lifestyle coaching. Um, so, and there was only one level of that. So as you kind of got through, and I was working a lot on the on aggressively through the mechanical stuff, I went to massage school, got my, my hands-on license and so forth. And that's kind of where I spent most of my time. And then kind of as a natural progression through Paul's program, like, the, like how he had gone um, through is figuring out that some of the results that you were doing weren't sticking. And you had to kind of figure out why it wasn't sticking because a lot of people have biochemical problems. They, they, they don't eat well. They're not hydrated. They don't sleep. They're really stressed out. And these things are hindering your progress. It didn't matter how good you were with manual therapy. It didn't matter how good you were with exercise prescription. You know, if you were dealing with a system that was overly stressed, you know, you couldn't keep those tonic muscles relaxed. You couldn't keep those phasic muscles switched on. And um, you were you were just kind of left with you know uh, an endless loop where you were just trying to always give your client quick fixes. So I, I kind of spawned off and I did metabolic typing and I really got into that. Studied all the references behind metabolic typing. I contacted people. You know, I mean, I was always that kind of guy who you know if you were a reference in the back of the book, I was going to call them. You know, because I wanted to know if it really worked, how they figured it out. It led me to Doctor. Awesome. Yeah, it led me to Doctor Eric Serrano, who was a, a medical doctor and. And at the time, early on, I started running a lot of lab tests. I got really into, into the functional medicine side of things, adrenal profile testing, all that kind of stuff with my clients. And that led me to Dr. Serrano and uh, went out to Ohio. We became good friends. And uh, I, I worked with him in his medical practice for about a year and a half. Went room to room with him with patients. And, you know, it was, it was, it's kind of been a crazy adventure um, going through all of this stuff with, with the education. So you know, back to the initial question, how far did I go? I kind of stopped at level three where we got to the mechanical stuff because once you started diving into the higher neurological systems like the eyes, the ears, the jaw, and so forth, um, you know, that's some complicated stuff. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of education and uh, practice. You got you to do it on a lot of people. So I always felt that, you know, doing anything past level three was, you know, it, it was a little bit of a vanity thing because, you know, there was so much material in level three that it, uh, to me, it took years and years to master. Um, so I'm still working on a lot of that stuff and, and gaining references and information on how to deal with the, the visual system, you know, dealing with jaw position, working with dentists and so forth to try and resolve some of these complicated cases with people. So um, I kind of stopped my education there and I moved laterally. You know, I did a lot of mm -hmm. other different types of stuff. No, and that's, and that's fair because I found myself kind of uh, in the same position. I kind of got to level one and then I was looking at doing level two and then I was just like it's not it wasn't exactly aligning with what I kind of was doing and what I wanted to do so that lateral move I think is uh, is clever now you just mentioned something about um, the visual system sorry Brian were you uh... okay go ahead you're fine oh. um, so have you heard of uh, a Z health Sam Yes, I have, and worked with uh, a number of uh, colleagues, and one of them is an, a master practitioner and was a teacher for Z Health, actually. His name was uh, Freddy's Garcia. He actually works for the um, um, for the Carrick Institute now. What's what's the Carrick Institute? 
So the Carrick Institute is um, a, a chiropractor. Um, uh, what's Carrick's first name? I forget. I forget now in the moment, of course. But they, they deal with a lot of sensory processing disorders. Um, people, and this is kind of becoming something, and it's not new, new, but um, it's becoming a lot more well-known, which is a lot more complicated cases that, that people have where they have issues with those auditory systems, with the visual system, with the jaw, all these sensory inputs that the brain is having a difficult time trying to assimilate all of that information and to process it effectively. So you're, you're coming up with and seeing a lot of disorders that are basically, um, I guess, in a, in a way, not exactly, but kind of like what fibromyalgia is, is it's kind of a wastebasket diagnosis, meaning there's we don't know what it is, um, but mm. people are showing symptoms of chronic stress and so forth, and it's because it's a multifactorial problem. It's not one singular issue. So you've got these people with these sensory processing problems who have vertigo um, and all sorts of other things like POTS and um, breathing disorders and so forth, and, and there's nothing diagnostic. You can't figure out what's wrong with them. So, so it's kind of like MS. You, you have a checklist, right? It, yeah, kind of like that. And what they're dealing with is they're putting people into these machines where they spin them upside down. They do all these sensory processing type of tests. They run labs on them. Um, pretty complicated stuff. And it's 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 fringy. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of people have been getting good results with it, especially when they have nowhere to turn. They got nowhere to go. You know, we got vertigo and no, they've been they've had every diagnosis, everything looked at medically. And technically, there's nothing wrong with them, but they're still experiencing this. So um that's that's the kind of institute that, that they work on. It's, it's very, very cool stuff, but um, it's chiropractic based, but there are practitioners who are licensed to diagnose from all over the place that go and take their training. But, you know, if you scale that back um, to, to kind of the individual processing systems, this is the kind of stuff that I got, I got interested in is figuring out, you know, how do you start to identify people who've got some of these sensory processing issues and, and get them to the right practitioner or help them in a very remedial way where you can um, you can help them ground themselves and, and deal with some of their issues, um, bringing it all the way back into why that person might have low back pain, neck pain, or, or something else that's just very, that seems very routine. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. in, in what you said earlier really kind of resonated. It's that they get results. You know, that's, that's the most important thing. Something can be fringy. Somebody can be swinging a crystal over my head, but if it fixes my problem... <laughs> You know, that's that's what matters to me. So the, the more I've I've kind of uh, involved myself into the stuff, the more I realized that everybody doing the mainstream stuff, they're not really getting the best results. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't. Sometimes I, I was going to write an article that's probably going to come out soon. It's, I, the title of it was basically, "I don't care why you think why your doctor thinks cupping is stupid." You know, um, <laughs> and, it, and it was just a good example of like. You know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, people spend a lot of time, and, and especially this has become an, an internet thing on social media where you have what we call the PubMed jockeys, where people, everything has to be validated with research oh on, on PubMed. And, you know, I have, a, I have an appreciation for that. There's research on things. But all it takes is, you know, a lot of these people to me are, are not people who are, you know, I call them clinicians. And a clinician is really somebody who works with somebody who's, um, who's got certain types of problems that you're helping them overcome. Not necessarily medical, you know, because a lot of us don't operate really in the medical space, but at the same time, they're coming in because they need help with something and you're trying to help them overcome an issue that they might be having. But a lot of these issues are multifactorial, they're multifaceted, and they cannot be, um, you can't really have research studies on those things because a lot of things work synergistically as well. Um, you can't tell me that somebody who has a manual therapy practice and if you look at research, research is, is very down on mechanical-based therapies, the osteopathic medicine, um, not the medicine medicine part of it, but the hands-on manipulation component, chiropractic. You know, essentially with the research, you read enough of this, you think that it doesn't work. And you have to realize that it's not just the mechanical therapy or the hands-on technique itself, which is doing the magic. It's about uh, the communication with the, the therapist, with the patient, threat reduction, removal of guarding. And it's using those hands-on techniques and that communication as a medium uh, for communication. And that is actually part of what makes the magic happen. So you can't take, you know, 100 people with, low, with non-specific low back pain and, and put them in a, you know, in a line and then just run them through and give every single person the same adjustment and expect there to be a positive outcome from that. <laughs> like, it's not going to work. 
Um, and, and that's the part that I think people struggle with because they want things to be very, very specific. If you do this mm -hmm. one adjustment, it's either you're going to prove or not prove that this entire discipline has a leg to stand on. And that, and that to me is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole black and white system. Like one plus one is two, right? Like no other way to get there. Yeah, and, and because they, I think that people who are, you know, very science, evidence-based minded, it, it just, it, it makes them cringe. And it literally gives them a sense of deep uncertainty um, that that things cannot be proven in that way or, or measured or calculated in that way. Um, and I think they hate that. And, you know, to me, it's like you, you have to, I straddle the line between both. And you need to have evidence-based approaches and you need to know what's working, but you also need to be open-minded enough to realize that you need to do what works as long as it's not dangerous to the patient as long as you're not formulating uh, beliefs in the patient that's going to make them more scared or guarded or more dependent on the therapist or something else like that I mean there are things to, to consider um, I, I think that it's it's fair game if you're helping people and it's safe mm. Brian and I make people cringe all the time <laughs> this is true <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good sometimes to break them out of their pattern, you know. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Some people don't appreciate it, though. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I mean, coming from the mechanical side of things, it, it people do tend to be attached to their patterns, and um, you know, it, it's breaking that up and allowing them to to find something new can uh, really shift uh, shift somebody's experience of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's their their connection. That's how they. I mean, it, and it's amazing to to look at things from you know bird's eye view. I think, and see that you know there's just one big constellation of patterns of of a human being moving through reality because they have to ground themselves, and it's how they make sense of things. And um, you know sometimes it's risky, maybe not at the conscious level, but at the subconscious level, to to move themselves away from that pattern because of what that might mean and how the system uh, might have to react. Um, to reorganize or, or to, to adapt, you know, and that's, that's, uh, that's something that we all deal with when we work with people with stuck patterns and states. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I, I wanted to kind of backtrack. We were talking about, uh, you know, the, the eye and the vestibular system and all that. That's kind of how we, we connected uh, uh, Michael Hoxson, one of our previous guests, uh, uh, kind of connected us. And, um, you know, do you have any... Um, I mean, obviously, every case is completely individual and different, but uh, do you have any, I guess, stories to, to kind of talk about somebody with, let's say, an, an inner ear dysfunction that uh, you were able to, to help and, and kind of what you did? Yeah, um, I mean, I've seen a, a, quite a number of cases of, of people with uh, vertigo and um, in particular, or some of these sensory processing type of problems that were kind of in the subclinical realm. And, and again, just to, to clarify, these aren't people that were so, you know, um, they were almost bedridden because they were throwing up every five minutes and feeling dizzy. But I mean, I've had a good amount of experience with people with low levels of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of times um, people with some of these processing issues you're going to find many, many things going on. Like, for example, you know, we all kind of know how important it is to look at the balancing of the upper neck, the upper cervical spine, and, you know, the jaw position if people have um, imbalances in their bike mechanics. Um, and even in the visual system, these things are very stressful for the body. And because the way that from the, our neurological system, you know, we look at the things that are most important for us to survive, it's being able to keep our eyes and our ears level with the horizon um, so we can avoid predators, we can move through space and, and organize reality, and um, also to be able to chew, to eat and digest and so forth. So we'll compromise a lot of other systems for that to occur. But in order for these compensations to, uh, to happen in the body, there's going to be effects somewhere else. And I think that the way that the body works for the most part is we're, we're meant to, to deal with and to tolerate sometimes even very high levels of stress for short periods of time. But the problem is, is when these issues become long standing and um, long standing means uh, failure to continue to adapt. And, and for a lot of us from the musculoskeletal or structural perspective, that means muscle fatigue. You know, we can't and, and leaning on certain structures. Eventually, those structures can no longer kind of support us and they degenerate. So for me, 
I think when working with these kinds of cases, when looking at someone with um, an inner ear based problem, again, that's low level. And again, to me, it's, it's hard to identify what inner ear means because the first thing I always do when somebody comes in is to make sure they see an appropriate medical professional to rule out something that's a, a medical situation. So if they've been cleared through a couple of ear, nose and throat doctors, you know, they've been to a general, usually a lot of times they've been to a migraine specialist or something like that, and nobody really has any answers for them. Um, you know, I'm always going to be looking at, you know, how much, uh, you know, dysfunction we find in, e in any of those smaller pieces. So we do an upper cervical or an upper neck assessment, see which way the head can turn well, where it's restricted, see how much muscle tonus we find in some of those deeper stabilizer muscles, how much jaw tension do they have, are they grinding their teeth? And usually you see, like we talked about, this kind of constellation of symptoms. And what I'm going to do is I start kind of unwinding that pattern. And for a lot of people, even before we start to, to deal with that upper quarter based issue, that upper body issue, um, I'll go back to the, the essence of life, which is breathing. You know, how well does this person breathe? And um, Dr. Carol Levitt was, a, was an expert on, in movement. He was kind of like in some ways, along with Vladimir Yanda, one of the, the fathers of this whole um, you know, postural syndrome kind of uh, movement said that, you know, if, if somebody basically, if breathing is not restored, nothing else will be. And I, I think that was very, very powerful statement that I, I never really forgot that when we don't look at how well someone breathes, then oftentimes you're going to see that a lot of these other complaints are going to be difficult to resolve. And that was a hard learning lesson for me, I'd say on multiple occasions when dealing with people with, with upper quarter issues, especially neck pain that it was very, very difficult to resolve any kind of neck problems if I didn't start with the rib cage first mm -hmm. um, b because of how the rib cage pumps and how that influences the, um, the amount of activity that your neck muscles were doing. And of course, the amount of activity and the trigger points that you have in your neck muscles, those all refer to the, the face and the neck. So you're, you're working from kind of the if you follow the lines of how trigger points work, you should kind of a lot of times if possible from a musculoskeletal perspective, follow those lines, you know, everything in the neck and the shoulders refers to the face. So um, we know that trigger points in the sternocleidomastoid, one of those forward head muscles uh, refer to the ear. So a lot of people with these kinds of, you know, inner ear aches or maybe even some kind of symptoms, you know, you might find very strong trigger points in the, in the sternocleidomastoid. Now, whether or not that's the cause or that's the effect, you know, is, is we don't know, um, but the presence of them can exacerbate some of these conditions. So point is, is that, you know, in those cases, a lot of times people with these issues, I go back to breathing. And once I was able to restore proper rib cage movement and then get to relaxing some of those trigger points in the neck and, and teaching person a, a good breathing strategy and getting their sympathetic nervous system to relax, they would, they would improve. And we didn't really do any kind of balance drills. You know, we didn't do anything that you would you would think would be working for the inner ear specifically or for the eyes or anything else. And in the global effects or the global strategy was working very well on what seemed to be a specific problem. Cool. That was a hell of an answer. It, it, really, it really was. <laughs> well, it, it feels like sometimes if to me, without appropriate context, um, you know, it's hard to you know, to really get a believable answer sometimes because we all kind of, from our perspective, know how complicated things really are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would say that, you know, sometimes my, my quick answers are, what would you say to somebody who has this kind of a problem? I would, I would oftentimes ask, do you have a prescription for Xanax? And it sounds like a weird question, but if somebody goes, yes, I do. And I say, well, when you take Xanax as prescribed by your doctor, do your symptoms get better? And they go, well, yeah, it makes a big difference. Well, what does Xanax do? You know, from a from a global perspective, what it does is it causes relaxation of the sympathetic nervous system. So I know at that point there's a possibility, a strong possibility that I'm going to be able to help somebody by by doing anything that I can do to calm down that person's sympathetic nervous system. I'm probably going to be able to help them in the same way um, in a non uh, pharmaceutical approach. Yeah, it tends to be the direction that we uh, we at least try to go in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that, that leaves, and that's, I think the most amazing thing is, is that if you can, you know that by reducing sympathetic stress, um, which I think is, we could say is true for a lot of different cases, that if by reducing sympathetic stressors and reactivity and sensitivity in the system, you get improvement, then there's a lot of options, you know, that and, and people really have not tried it all. 
they, they really have not. And um, I have hope. And that brings me hope when I, when I see these cases of people that say that nothing has worked. Um, I know that they haven't done everything possible to identify and reduce uh, sympathetic stressors, not just from a, you know, a mechanical standpoint, but also nutritionally and, and lifestyle wise and, and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, the thought patterns and, and all of that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, is it, and that leaves open a lot of potential for alternative um, types of therapies to, to work some, some magic for these people. Hmm. Yeah, well, Brian, you, you just said thought patterns, and I find that extremely interesting because when somebody um, is stressed out or somebody gets, you know, all uh, caught up in their in their mind – automatically you see shoulders come up, you see breathing go completely wrong. You're just like, that's going to have an impact, especially if that's their day after day pattern. You know, somebody's training that 24 hours a day. Not bueno. Yeah. It's, it's like I tell my clients, you know, that when I, I'm teaching them how to breathe properly using the diaphragm and uh, basically say, you know, with every single breath you take, your shoulders are hiking up to your ears. No wonder you have a lot of stress and tension in your upper back and neck. Yeah, it's kind of like self-inflicted. It's totally self-inflicted. Yeah, well, I mean, I blame drivers on the road. I, I they take half of it. <laughs> Way to take Gosh, responsibility it's... there, Claw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's I can idea. I, I can what attest idea. to that one. Sitting in traffic in Los Angeles is is definitely going on the list of of, of stressors for my clients. Yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. myself. <laughs> LA traffic is ridiculous. Like I love LA, but the traffic—it's like you, you, if you want to go somewhere, go there at like three a.m. You know? <laughs> yeah, then it's a beautiful city. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's funny. I was actually watching a short video with uh, Wayne Dyer earlier that he was talking about. Uh, you know, it, everyone can be as spiritual as they want until they get in their car, and then they're motherfucking everybody. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh, man, that's great. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. Wayne Dyer, man. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Oh, oh okay. speaking a little bit off topic, uh, have Is you guys seen that really? shot, <laughs> shot in the topic. Dark? Yeah, I know. No. No, it's on Netflix. It's like a, kind of a documentary about these guys who go out in the middle of the night in L.A. They're called Stringers, and they, like, video. They, they follow, like, ambulances and police cars and, like, fire trucks and they video all like the crazy shit happening at night for the morning news and they sell it. That's like how they make their livelihood. It's so cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, like if you watch the first episode, I can almost guarantee you're going to be hooked because you're just like, oh my God, how do these people do this job? Oh, not to mention staying up all night, but the crap that they have to see and deal with. Eesh. Yeah, that doesn't sound very pleasant to me. No, but it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> It's okay to watch. Absolutely. So, Sam, right now in, in your um, in your practice, like, I mean, you seem to have kind of like a method or a system in place. Um, is there anything outside of it that you're studying? Or, like, what are you uh, – what's new? Um, that's a really good question. So what's new? I, I would probably say that, you know, at, at this point um, – You I know I'm, everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm overeducated for a lot of the stuff that I see, um, you know, and that depends on, you know, the kind of business that you have and, and um, who your network is and, and who refers to you. I, I have a collection of medical doctors who tend to refer more challenging cases to me. Um, but then I also have, you know, a core group of clients that send me things that are just kind of every day, you know, back spasms and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I find it you know, challenging as you go down that rabbit hole for more, more and more complicated cases, you know, that's, it's hard work and it's a lot of brain work and it's, and it's fairly exhausting. And, and I really do respect um, practitioners that see those kinds of, of clients all day. Um, it's, you know, because you're constantly on the cusp of trying to figure things out where there really isn't any kind of straightforward process. And I think that, you know, if you look at a place like the Carrick Institute that might see those kind of patients all day, every day, they have to have a rigid process for how they screen and they evaluate people and develop, you know, therapy programs um, because they're seeing a very specific kind of niche of person. But um, when you're kind of an average practitioner where you see a lot of different types of things all the time, 
um, you're really al always going to be focusing on what's in front of you. you know, and, and I think that, as you guys probably know, you get batches of things. You know, for, for a while, it's like, why is it that everybody has tennis elbow? You know, and you get like four or five of these things in a row, and then you hit the textbooks and you go, well, what's new in, in, in tennis elbow world that I, I don't know? And then you're, you're kind of working on that, and, um, and, you know, that's why they call it the practice. You know, you're practicing on the people that uh, you're seeing in front of you and trying to always advance what you're seeing. And recently, it's, I find that you're, it's like this big um, kind of circle going back and saying, you know, okay, now I'm seeing a string of SI joint-based clients. And, um, you know, for a while, I was seeing, you know, some of these sensory processing kind of problem people let's see what some of these techniques help or what they do on these SI joint people. And uh, sure enough, you might say, oh, wow, you know, I really wasn't doing a lot of breathing work with these SI joint people back in the day, and now I'm doing it. And now a lot of those um, trigger points or a lot of those uh, facilitated patterns of, of, of muscles now kind of release on their own when I do the breathing work with some of these people. So that was a big thing that I was missing. So you're always just kind of like trying to you know, go back through what you were doing with your therapy protocols and making them better so you get faster results. And, and I'd say that that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, it's it's not too frequent that you see me hitting textbooks about just kind of milling over um, new hands-on therapy techniques and so forth. It, it's, it's a lot more about just kind of getting things to work in actual practice and uh, streamlining so you, uh, you consistently get better results. Hmm. Now I've I've got a question. You seem like you're you're right in the thick of the corrective exercise kind of corrective manipulation world. There's a lot of certifications. There's a lot of uh, courses and uh, institutes and all sorts of things for somebody just starting out in this uh, kind of field. Let's say they've been a trainer for a year or two. Where would you uh, where would you kind of guide them? Oh, I, I, that's a great one because now I'm at a gym. And, uh, you know, I was running as a, as a director for the gym for over a year and a half, and I'm coming across a lot more trainers who are just kind of getting started, and that question has come up a lot. And, and to be honest, I've, I've struggled with that, um, mm -hmm. of giving a, a generalized recommendation. And the, and the problem, the reason why is because it really deter depends on which direction you want to go within the industry. I think, just like everything else, um, before you hop into a profession, you should really do an internship to see what it's really going to be like. Um, I think a lot of trainers get into the corrective exercise kind of realm and space without a real understanding of how that information is going to really be applied. I think they get uh, a little despondent when they start to realize that a lot of the general population who just wants to come in and get fit and lose a couple of pounds are not really interested and are bored by doing any kind of corrective exercise stuff. They, they really don't want to do that, and, and it's just not the niche. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it's always been easy to get clients and to build my business because I, I speak directly to say, hey, do you, you know, you want to work out more aggressively, you want to get results, but you're afraid of going to the gym because you've got orthopedic problems and you want to work with somebody who can help you. Um, those are the kind of clients I see. And, and it kind of takes you down that rabbit hole where, you know, those people might come in and they might be really messed up or, you know, they got meniscus issues, they got SI joint problems. And they're not going to be those people you're going to take out to the exercise floor and just start squatting them and deadlifting. Um, you have to do some remedial work with them. And a lot of trainers, I find, are actually bored by that as well. You know, and it's like you kind of have to know, um, is that the kind of work you want to do with people? And if that's the case, um, I think there's no better way to start than, than NASM. I think NASM has really done a fantastic job with, um, you know, getting trainers educated on the essential components of looking at assessment and corrective exercise. I think the CES program in particular is fantastic because they actually give people the trainers protocols. You know, here's what happens when somebody's got a shoulder problem or a back problem. And, um, you know, when you go through their protocols, there's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't use um, because I think there are faster ways to do things or that information isn't exactly correct in my perspective. But, you know, having something that's a little bit more cookie cutter is helpful. And um, from that, it gives you a good foundation, but you still need to be mentored. I think being mentored is, is, is immensely valuable. Working with somebody who's, um, who's kind of gone through these processes and says, hey, this works, that doesn't work. This sounds really good in a textbook, um, but in reality doesn't work as well. 
Um, I think that's a fantastic way to go. And then, you know, graduating and moving into something like the Czech Institute or, um, again, it's to me, it's like getting the foundation of exercise. And then how can you get yourself into some kind of internship coaching program? I, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the best way to go. For sure. I mean, having somebody there like in the room with you that you can discuss a problem with, that's it's pretty much priceless. Like, you can't get that out of a textbook or a correspondence course. Um, but but yeah, no, I, I've I've kind of had the question posed to me, too, like what what kind of certifications do you recommend? And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And um, it's it is uh, so that's why I always try to ask people, you know, what their thoughts are, because it's it's um, there's so many things out there now, and there's there's more by the day. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and sometimes you just need to stay general until you figure that out, because you may not know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I, I think that that's been, and I've, I've, admittedly, I've been um, guilty of kind of moving people away from the pain side of things because, you know, in working with people who have chronic pain for sixteen years, it it takes. It takes a certain kind of person, you know, and you've got to be committed and you've got to want to um, to constantly keep learning about this kind of stuff, not only uh, from a perspective of the mechanics and so forth, but also developing your communication skills, um, learning pain science, uh, really doing everything you possibly can to help that uh, type of population because they really deserve the best of you. And if you're not in it uh, full speed, then I would recommend not doing it you know, do something that's a little bit more uh, general, uh, work on just getting people in the gym and getting them healthy because there's a lot you can do in that space. Um, but I think in the corrective exercise realm and working with people who have pain, um, I, I don't feel it's appropriate to be someone who tinkers. You know what I mean? Mm. It, it makes sense, you know, because um, at the end of the day, you're doing this for the clients, you know, or you should be doing it for the clients. Yeah. Right. And the, the, the most important thing is their results. Absolutely. And, and, and why people you, keep coming back. And what you're passionate about. I, I think that that, you know, in very early on, I always taught, you know, do the thing you're passionate about. And to me, it just kind of fell on deaf ears. It didn't really, I didn't really understand, understand that. And then as I've gotten older and, you know, um, not that I'm, I'm old by any means, but um, I've, I've suffered from a lot more musculoskeletal issues. I've had problems with um, kind of extreme fatigue, burnout in my 20s, um, anxiety issues and so forth. And when you have to go through some of that stuff, uh, you really start to, to develop a, an understanding and a, a compassion for people that go through that same sort of thing. And if you're interested in, you know, and you've been committed to fixing yourself and learning this stuff, it, you become easily passionate about helping other people go through, uh, successfully go through what you've been through. And um, I think that helps. Not to say that you have to be in extraordinary pain uh, to be able to help people in pain, but if you at least understand a portion of their reality, um, then you're going to be in a, in a good space to be able to help those people. Oh, 100%. I mean, you can connect with them better. You understand with them better. I mean, uh, Brian and I, we used to be uh, quite some chubby boys. So <laughs> when weight loss clients come to us, we're kind of like, yeah, we've been there. And it's kind of hard to believe us because – we look deceptively in shape, um, or at least <laughs> I appreciate not that. Out shape, not <laughs> out of shape, maybe. And um, yeah, no, but it, it's um, like you can see their whole demeanor changes when they realize that you get their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when you can share your own experience with somebody else and, and have them understand that, you know, yes, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar. They tend to uh, have a bit more faith and, and uh, understand that you might have a bit more uh, um, empathy, I guess, would be the right word. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've got a question. Oh, I mean, I've got lots of questions, Sam. But where, where do you see your practice in like 10 years time or what do you see yourself doing? Cause obviously you're a very smart, very educated guy. You know, a lot of folks, I could see you creating your own certification or program or course. Um, I hope I'm not spoiling anything by, by doing <laughs> that, by saying that out loud, but it's like, I, I could see you doing something, but like that's, that's the question. A lot of, um, people in our industry, it's like, they think kind of more in the now or more in the one or two years. 
So what, where are you going to be? What are you, uh, what's your grand plan? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just continuing to find more flow. Um, as I was studying more of the, the personal development side, um, always keeping in mind someone like um, Maslow's hierarchy where, you know, you're looking at self-actualization. I mean, I think we're all ultimately trying to move toward that. And self-actualization is really about understanding and knowing what all of your preferences are and um, being 100% clear and, and okay. And um, um, I guess okay with expressing your uniqueness and, you know, what you really appreciate and love to do and um, figuring out what puts you in flow doing that. So where is the flow? Um, I love creating content, but content not so much. I think a lot of the information out there is edutainment. I think a lot <laughs> of it is about clicks. It's about um, just getting marketing messages in front of people. And I, I'm completely fine with that because that's how business operates. But I, I have a difficulty, a difficult time creating content like that. For me, I love to give honest information, basically, and it's very usable. And it's like this is exactly how you fix X, Y, Z, and getting that information out there. And I've been recently doing that a lot more of that on social media now that I've got a little bit more time that I'm not directing the gym, and starting to rebuild all of my content and starting to put information out there um, that's based upon what I see actually work in practice. And I think that kind of is the challenging part is that there's a lot of information out there that you see that doesn't, again, it's like textbook information and you can very much see the people that are pumping out the content have never actually done that work. What they've done is they, they copied it or they've seen it in a book or a certification and now they're pawning it off as their own or they're just sticking it out there without really an understanding of like, Again, the, the nuances of instructing something or um, what really does or doesn't work when you're working with people. So I see that there's a huge space for um, some of the things that we talked about today um, about how to figure out what the best thing is for the, for the person that's sitting in front of you and actually developing a therapeutic program that's realistic where it might not be as sexy as what most people want you to think because they want you to, to think that you're doing super complicated stuff. Um, and, and really it's all about the evaluation and about the communication, extracting information and trying to figure out how to get healthcare professionals and so forth to work together on cases rather than just dealing with this endless, um, exhausting turf war between hands-on therapy practitioners and personal trainers, which drives me nuts and has <laughs> always um, caused me to want to move away from the field um, mm -hmm. without, again, realizing that there is a very clear boundary, um, which we can talk about too with diagnostic and non-diagnostic and treatment of conditions and um, working with people with non-specific conditions, the lines are pretty easy. But you know, when practitioners are feel threatened, they don't work together, they create a lot of friction, and then it just like divides the fields and creates more problems for people that just want to get better. Um, but to me, I think that there's some kind of integration there in the middle of all of that of, of teaching. And to me, um, I want to move toward, yeah, I would teach people, I would teach trainers and only people who are really, really highly committed to the craft and getting better. You know, people just want to come in and learn some techniques or tools and want to make a lot of money or something. They're in it for the wrong reason. And, um, I teach a certain way. And if, if they can uh, get in alignment with the way that I do things, then I, I'd be interested in teaching some courses and, and really getting people educated on, on how to get at least some of the same kind of results that I have. And of course, progress might work because they're going to be able to put their own input in there and be like, hey, I bet you never considered this and bringing things to the table to really advance the model. Hmm. Well, not to shine your shoes too much. That's when you're telling <laughs> you guys can use that. Um, but the way that you talk about things and the way that I see that your thought processes work, um, it's like, yeah, shit, I wouldn't mind watching watching a, um, like a video course or, um, you know, maybe maybe if you ever come out to Toronto, I could uh, I could buy you dinner and lunch, and uh, you could just download all your information into me, and then uh, <laughs> the Matrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I'd just be a Android. Uh, I thought we were trying to you. stay away from pills these days, Claude. Yeah. Pills. <laughs> pills are great, man. <laughs> Depending oh, on the context, there there is no good or bad, right? It just depends Touché. on the context. This is very true. It's very uh, postmodernist, but it's true. This is a, a very uh, contextual conversation. <laughs> We're philosophers, Brian, at the end of the day. We are. We are. Which, uh, excited to uh, be uh, launching our new project soon, which God only knows how that's going to go. But 
I think it's going to go well. Good job. I, I do, thoughts. too. I do, Good too. vibrations. <laughs> Maybe I should say vibrations but, on the uh, podcast. People get the wrong idea. Yeah. Uh, sorry so, about this, Sam. <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. No I, worries. I are yeah. special people. Um, so, so here's a question for it. Uh, is there, or, or maybe I could rephrase, what technique uh, ha- did you use maybe, say, five, ten years ago that you haven't even thought about or used in, you know, several years, and what have you kind of replaced that with? Ooh, wow. What I'm technique? Search of memory banks. That's a good one. I'm, I'm trying to create a reference for technique. Um, you know, I guess the, only, the first thing that comes to mind on that is how, you know, through Paul Check, I used a lot of the blood pressure cuff techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I hope that's a good example. And, you know, it was a really about biofeedback, about teaching people rib cage position and, and all that kind of stuff and using visual strategies. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I've really gotten away from, wow, okay, this is, this is, that was a great question. I've really gotten away from moving people away from um, visual-based learning strategies and getting them into kinesthetic strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's because ultimately what we find is, is that people are too reliant on their visual system to the point where they feel like they're they're completely lost without it. And um, there's, a, there's a good vertigo case as that somebody who had come to me with uh, vertigo, they couldn't ride a bicycle, this woman in particular. She had difficulties with that because of, you know, so much sensory input that was coming in. And when I, when I was working with her, I was teaching her a lot of um, techniques where I was eventually trying to get her to close her eyes. And she had a lot of difficulty with that, especially in a standing position, even when she was supported, she was holding on to something um, because she was so reliant on the visual system for information. And she's like, I don't understand how I would be able to do this. And I was like, look, you know, uh, always remind people, it seems to be a very powerful simile, is that, you know, do blind people need to see to walk? No, they don't. Um, they, they just use or upregulate another sensory system uh, in order to, to be able to perform that, that activity. So they're using their kinesthetic system instead of the visual system. So yes, you can. You, you're, you're just, you as a human being have become so lopsided in your visual system. And when we go back to the, um, the blood pressure cuff example, we're using visual feedback to teach people where their lower back is. Um, so they're, they're using a blood pressure cuff. They're looking at that dial to try and feed, to, to, to see what's happening. And oftentimes we assume that that visual strategy carries over to kinesthetic and a lot of times it doesn't. So they can do the, the technique with the, the dial, but as soon as you take the blood pressure cuff away, they can't do it. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of times I've tried to teach people very quickly, I'll use a visual strategy, but I very, tr- very quickly try to get them to feel something. Um, because the more they can feel something, the, the you have something from them that they, could, they can always go inside and use a reference that's kinesthetic. Um, I think a lot of people will always figure out a visual strategy for the most part to do something. So um, I don't worry so much about that. I worry a lot more about their kinesthetic system. And I also try to uh, use some more sensory inputs like auditory to try to get them to anchor in and experience to have multiple strategies to be able to, to do something. So um, I guess that's that's kind of the key technique that I've I've moved away from is is a lot of visual based strategies, mirrors and all that kind of stuff, and try to get them to use other other systems. Cool, I, I love that answer. Thank you. No, it's, it's super important. And sorry to cut you off, Brian, but some of the um, female clients I have they they do this more often, so, though some males do it too. You sexist um, bastard. I'm sorry, I had to I had to do it. Uh, <laughs> They they almost intuitively like when I tell them to feel them something in their body they intuitively close their eyes you know mm. in order to to try and feel it more actually feel it so I'm just like good good on you I mean I don't I don't tell people to close their eyes but I always say that it's an option you know mm-hmm. and um, generally it it helps you know nine times out of ten and, and for the, for those people at home that have not experienced. Uh, or, you know, kind of what Sam was talking about. If you go ahead and stand on one foot and then close your eyes, you will notice how much more difficult uh-huh. it is to balance with your eyes closed than with your eyes open. Yeah, kind of, kind of, uh, you know, important stuff, balance. Yeah, I always freak clients out with that one. What's that? They, well, the, the stand on one foot and close your eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's like, oh my god, I can't do it. My balance is terrible. I'm like, if you could do it, you would surprise me. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So, um, 
Sam, is there anything you would like to discuss or talk about before we move into our uh, rapid fire wrap up question? Super extra extraordinary. Um, yeah. I oh, was going to use another you've, you've bird, changed but... the name. That's that's cool. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm still I'm still fine tuning things. You know, I'm still working on it little by little. I, you know, I got to be honest. It's like I try to restrain how much talking I I do because uh, unless prompted, I'll I'll go off in a million different tangents, and this interview will be forever long. And uh, like, who knows where it might go? Um, I still want the readers or the listeners to be able to. Um, to, to follow everything so it's, it's really is better if you guys just prompt me <laughs> <laughs> all, all right we'll, we'll be splitting this three-hour podcast into uh, three episodes <laughs> there you go there you go um so uh, i guess uh, and this is a, actually an interesting question i haven't asked in, in a while is do you currently work with a coach or mentor or, or i guess another uh side of that would be do you currently coach or mentor anyone um, in terms of me working with a mentor, I, I found that that's only oftentimes on very specific things. I mean, I think that working with somebody in person as a mentor, no. Um, I, I work with mentors on the on the marketing side of things for sure because that's kind of like an area that I need a lot more learning and coaching on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an area where I, I need so much more education and, and uh, guidance. Um, but from a from the practice side of things, not really. A lot of my mentors and and people that I'll tell you who my mentors are, some of these people I've never even met. Like I've never met Paul St. John from uh, who taught neuromuscular therapy, mm -hmm. um, but I've watched all of his videos and it's like, you know, I'm a visual learner and I've watched them so many times and to the point where like I, I know his language, I know how he says things that I feel like I know the guy. And, you know, that's someone to me as a mentor and I, I still feel you can absorb mentoring um, you know, knowledge and help through textbooks, through video, through all of that stuff. So in that way, I feel like I, I'm, I'm mentored quite a bit through a lot of people. But as a as a in person live mentor, no, I don't I don't have anybody uh, at the moment. And um, um, I would have to say though that one person has strongly influenced me massively in the past couple of years is Ron Oreska from the Postural Restoration Institute. I mean, I think the guy's a visionary. And um, a lot of the things that he says are, you know, first of all, it's sometimes it's impossible to understand the man's metaphors. <laughs> but now I'm, I mean, somebody, to the point where like, I don't even know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> but um, I think over time, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that whatever he's saying is profound. And I'm, I'm interested in discovering if that is actually the case. Um, and from a mentoring side, I do have a couple of people that I coach and um, just trying to get them up to speed in the industry and, and talking about what we had talked about is helping them kind of discover a little bit more about which direction they want to go. Um, a couple of people who I'm always asked, you know, Sam, should I go to the Czech Institute? Should I show, go take Paul's trainings? And it's, it's a difficult question. And I say, look, there's not much I can tell you about whether or not I think you should. Why don't you come, you know? check out the work that I do, um, come in, we'll, we'll do some work together, or I'll, I'll show you some work on some other people, and uh, see if that's the kind of direction you want to go. Because if it is, then I, I would go take that training. But um, that's the kind of mentoring role that I'm in right now. It's n nothing exclusive, but more as a guidance role. Okay, cool. Now, uh, if you had to, uh, I'm not sure where in California you are, but if you had to rescue three books from a fire, what books would they be? I'm actually I'm actually just south of the fire, like a couple oh, wow. of miles from, from the one in 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 Santa Monica area. You know that was in like the the hills area where Beverly Hills is and so forth. Oh, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, it it really was. That was the Skirball one, but the most of the fires now are are really far north by more than forty miles, so um, pretty far away. Um, if I were to get three books, um, I would I would have to pick a communication book. I would probably c pick something that's high up on the scale of um, just like a movement-based philosophy to help people understand things, and then maybe something specific. Um, first of all, I'd say that I, I really do think that a lot of my education and my ability to learn has come through something that, again, is more fringy that most people, uh, I think from a, from a bird's eye view, uh, will have a lot of conflict with, but until they dive into the system and see what it's all about, um, I think they would have a lot more appreciation for is neurolinguistic programming. And um, I think that from a perspective of just understanding language, understanding surface structure, deep structure, um, extracting and listening to being able to hear values and beliefs in the way that people talk, 
and how they use language to kind of reconstruct what they might be doing in their mind or their experience is, is probably a critical thing. Helps you understand people a lot more and especially when it comes to working with clients. Um, there was a book that was uh, tailored from NLP toward the, the health-based practice. Um, I think it was called Magic in Practice and it's something I always recommend. It was made for doctors to teach them how to communicate a little better with their clients. Um, to use presuppositional language to help alter beliefs, uh, to build hope, hope in therapy and so forth. And I think that goes a long way for practitioners on the language end. Um, there's, a, there's an aspect of NLP that's, that's very airy-fairy that I would not recommend, but the language-based model, I think, is immensely powerful. Um, so I would recommend the book Magic in Practice. Um, a book that, there's a couple of movement books that I think are really, really fantastic from a, a philosophy standpoint that will change how you see things. Some of them are more therapy based that would, um, that are kind of complicated reads. You know, uh, Sarman's book, um, Diagnosis and Treatment of Movement Based Disorders is, I think is a fantastic book that should be in everybody's uh, reference. That's, that's and, Shirley Sarman? Yeah, Sarman's book, absolutely. I think it's fantastic. There's also a couple of books that are just a great accumulation of information. Um, uh, Leon, I, I think I always say it's Shaitao, Shaito. And um, Judith Delaney wrote the books, um, Techniques of Neuromuscular Principles, or Neuromuscular Techniques, I, I can't remember the name of it actually. It's a two-part series, um, and it's basically like a compendium of all neuromuscular therapy kind of information. Looking at posture, um, looking at trigger points, muscles, and using basic techniques, positional release, uh, reciprocal inhibition, post-isometric relaxation, basic osteopathic kind of techniques as well um, for treating tissues in the body. And I think it's a great, great uh, two-part series that's worth the investment. I think it's, you know, it's the modern version of Travell and Simon's book, um, you know, for trigger points. Uh, much more evolved, much more inclusive, and updated. You know, I think it's a great reference manual. Who was the author again on this? Judith Delaney, who was okay. Paul St. John's former business partner, who split off, who designed uh, her own neuromuscotherapy program, NMT Center, and um, Leon Tricow, the famous uh, naturopath, osteopath from the UK, prolific author, wrote a lot, a lot of books on um, musculoskeletal-based issues. Yeah, if you have not heard of him, you need to investigate, absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant man. And, you know, he's, a, he's aggregated so much information and has continued to advance and evolve in the field, even as, you know, pain science education and so forth has changed so much in the field and, and everybody is starting to kind of become uh, anti-mechanical or, you know what I mean? And um, he's maintained, you know, his position on, of accumulating all of this information and seeing how it all works together. Um, you know, it just, that's, that's a respectful stance. I, re I really appreciate the work that he's done. He's doing. Um, the third book I'd have to say is now you go into to exercise based land and, you know, there's so much out there. I, I said the NASM, you know, CES book, I think is fantastic. I think, you know, uh, great Cook, CrossFit level one, manual. CrossFit level one. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it, well, there we go. Context, right? If you just want to go in and whoop some ass and, you know, develop some exercise programs to toughen people up, that's probably a good way to go. Um, but oh no, on my end of things, I, I think um, Ray Cook's books are fantastic. Understanding, I think you know how he views movement, um, and his great statement, which we'll never, never forget, is "Move well first, and then move often." Um, you, you can't forget that. I mean, that's that's so 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 important. You tell people in a world they need to move a lot more. Um, yeah, they do. But the problem we always come into is that people don't move well, and so they run into problems. Uh, so we got to teach them to move well and then to move more. Understanding his philosophy in there, um, I think it, movement something. I can't remember the name of the book. I'm sorry. I think but, it's actually just movement. Uh, then there's the be. athletic body imbalance by him. Yeah, that's but, a fantastic. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, when you've got those three books in there, you can spawn off or splinter off into a lot of, of sub books that really can flesh out a lot of that content. But I, I think that's my three recommendations. Beautiful. I like them. Yeah. So uh, a couple more real quick before we, uh, we get, get off of here. Uh, who is the first person that comes to mind or what is your definition of the optimum human? Uh, the optimum human. <laughs> 
Um, well, the optimum human is, um, I think, is the extreme version of adaptability. Um, as, as somebody who's not stuck in any way, but also has some kind of grounding. Um, that if we look at, again, Maslow's level of, of self-actualization, um, you can't have um, infinite flexibility because nothing grounds you. Um, you have to be able to exist and to be able to reference and, you know, have somebody who, who's, who has enough experience in their life. And I think Maslow said that people didn't self-actualize oftentimes until they were at least 40 or 50 years old mm -hmm. um, because it took enough life experience to understand their preferences, to have to understand what they do like, what they don't like, what they're passionate about, or what they're what you know uh, they staunchly support, et cetera. Um, those things and understanding those things that just kind of stick, that are your the boundaries of of someone uh, their beliefs that they've formulated in, in their in their lives that they don't really think are ever going to change because they're so important to them. And then everything else around that is flexible um, and is open to understanding and learning and progressing and evolving in a way where. Um, you, you're flexible, you, you are willing to take on new beliefs and new strategies um, as long as they are ecological with your, you know, the thing that grounds you. So I think that that kind of person, and, and you can come, you can take that and you can generalize that into all areas, you know, uh, movement within, you know, your perceptions of uh, more complicated things in life, politics, all that kind of stuff, right? World events. Mm -hmm. And just be flexible and adaptable in a way where your system is 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 okay with changing and being on the move, um, and and having that adaptation without constantly feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know what I, I like it. I, it's like uh, bend but don't break, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right on. And Brian? Yep. And <laughs> Sam, drum roll. who would you want to hear on this podcast? And what would you want to hear them talk about? Oh, I want to... Um, I want to hear from, from clinicians. Um, I, I think I've had my fill over the years of, of people who stand in the guru side of things of people who travel around, who lecture, who talk. Um, I want to see people that you never even heard of. You know what I mean? Um, people who are just, you know, seeing 12 patients a day, every day, who are successful clinicians. They don't have time for anything else. Um, and I want to hear their experience of the day in and the day out of working with individual types of uh, clients and scenarios and so forth. I, I really love hearing their stories. And, um, you know, one of them is, you know, I have a physical therapist that I had worked with um, when I was 19 and I, I first started doing um, all of this work and he had been a PT for 15 years and now, you know, he lives in Vegas and um, every once in a while I check in to kind of see what he's up to. This guy's been a PT for, you know, 30 years uh, and plus and he still sees 10 patients a day, every day. And, um, you know, he's always learning and evolving and growing and sitting in, and listening to what have you learned through seeing all of these people? Because it's absurd how many how many patients he's seen. Um, what have you learned? What kind of things, um, as you've been committed to your practice, have you? What insights do you have? I, I'm interested in that kind of stuff um, because it's it's real raw experience. Um, psychologists, people who do cognitive behavioral psychology, and who are at the top of their game in the same way. Um, what are you discovering after you know sitting in a room with thousands and thousands of people spending tens of thousands of, of clinical hours working with people um, with human behavior, with change, with where do they resist and what do we need to develop in terms of systems and therapies to get people over these, these hurdles. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have individual people in mind, but those are the things that I'm super, super interested in at this point. Cool. Well, we will uh, make sure to reach out to, to some people you haven't heard of and have them on. We'll let <laughs> you know. Yeah, we'll get some nameless people on here for you. <laughs> so last but not least, um, where can people find out more about you, Sam, and what you do? If you search my name in Google, you'll see a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of videos on my YouTube channel, um, but my home base now is the rebranding, which you'll see kind of starting to take shape and form uh, over time as I keep kind of finding my new space. 
um, which is uh, release muscle therapy. Uh, so it's releasemuscletherapy.com, and that's kind of like the home, the new home site. Um, but you, if you Google my name again, you'll find a lot of information about uh, my YouTube channel. I have a back pain site that's been around for I don't know more than a decade, which has just accumulated a lot of stuff on it. Um, but I keep it there for archiving purposes. But the YouTube channel is where a lot of new stuff is, and releasemuscletherapy.com. That's where always you can reach out to me and um, and find new stuff, see what I'm up to. Beautiful. And you've got uh, something free for uh, our listeners, correct? Do I have something free for them? Yes. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of resources on um, my site. And, of course, if you shoot me an email, I'll hook you up with a couple of my new uh, guides on ergonomic hacking and, and also some of my soft, top soft tissue tools. Um, we've got resources and reports on SI joint problems and so forth as well. So if you want to kind of all those free goodies just you can shoot me an email and we'll put you on the list and, and get you some free stuff beautiful we'll get that uh, up on the show notes which uh, you can always find at the optimumhuman.com all right well sam thank you for coming on and uh bearing the burden of our company <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I enjoyed it i really did i good. like being poked and prodded it's it's a fun process <laughs> you know there's people that pay good money for that <laughs> right right there is especially in los angeles right <laughs> <And so. laughs> I bet. well sam i i will say i do see a round two coming up uh, at some point in the future but uh, until then we uh, appreciate it and uh uh, to all our listeners who uh, didn't even make it through this episode, because this was not a fiasco as, as a lot of them are, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. I appreciate right. it. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, thank Sam. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to the Optimum Human Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to head on over to iTunes and give a five-star rating and review, which will help spread the word to more awesome listeners just like you. Head on over to theoptimumhuman.com and subscribe to the free newsletter and get the Optimum Human's Blueprint to the Optimum Life. Download it instantly. Thanks for listening.